Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back. Or if you're new here, welcome. Today I want to share with you a case that I cannot believe I'd never heard of until one of you guys recommended I look into it in the comments of another video. So please do always let me know your requests, chances are I will see it. This week we're going to be taking a look at a still unsolved serial killer case from the 1960s, Jack the Stripper. No, that really isn't a typo in the title, that actually was a serial killer dubbed as so by the press. But you'll also often find this case referred to as the Hammersmith Nude Murders. This is technically considered to be more of a historic case now, but despite still remaining unsolved, the Metropolitan Police did refuse to reopen the case last year, despite pressures to do so. But I do really think that a little bit of extra publicity really could work wonders for this case in particular. I mean, researching unsolved true crime is literally my job, and I personally had never heard of this case, despite it being in London, like half an hour away from me. And so I would imagine that a lot of other people haven't heard of it either. The story of Jack the Stripper begins on Sunday 2nd of February 1964 in Hammersmith, a district in West London, England. It's a freezing cold winter's morning, but one man is up bright and early walking his dog down a path on the bank of the River Thames. It's not long before he spots something out of place, a human body washed up on the bank. As always does seem to be the case, at first this man thought this was a mannequin. I don't think anybody ever really wants to compute that they're looking at a dead body. But soon he realised the truth, it was the body of a woman. Some other sources say that she was discovered by rowers on the river, but regardless, police were quickly called to the scene. The body was found naked apart from a pair of stockings. She had been strangled, several of her teeth were missing and her underwear had been stuffed in her mouth. It was soon confirmed that her identity was that of 30-year-old Hannah Tailford and she was pregnant at the time of her death with two other children to care for. Hannah had had a very difficult life. She was born into a mining family in Lancashire and had been excluded from multiple schools as a child because she was just so disruptive. When she was a teenager, she ran away to London where she quickly found work as a sex worker, finding herself in trouble with the law for soliciting and theft. She generally just had a really hard life, and from there it was only going to get harder. Rumour had it that Hannah had connections to the London underground sex scene, sex parties and pornography. There are even reports that she was paid to take part in high society sex parties held by aristocrats, a story that would later lend some theories of her death. Some said she was silenced by somebody high up in this world. Of course, that has never been confirmed though, it was just rumours. The last confirmed sighting of Hannah alive came on January 24th and she wasn't discovered on the bank of the Thames until nine days later, which matched with the post-mortem report that said she'd been in the water for at least a week or more. In no surprise for the time, the authorities just pretty much brushed off Hannah's death. It seems that they must have known that she didn't do this to herself, she didn't strangle herself and put her underwear in her mouth, but it wasn't considered that she'd been the victim of a crime. She was a sex worker, what was she to expect? People, including the police, had very little sympathy for her. The police simply marked down her death as a suicide and went on with their days. But of course, that wasn't to be the end of it. On the 8th of April 1964, the body of 26-year-old Irene Lockwood from Nottingham was found floating naked in the river near Chiswick. Irene was of a similar build to Hannah as she was slim and petite, and once again, she had been pregnant at the time of her death. Her post-mortem showed that she'd been in the water for less than 48 hours at the time of her discovery, and it was very clear that she hadn't drowned. She had very clearly been stripped naked and thrown in the river post-mortem, having been strangled with some kind of ligature that investigators suspected were made of her own clothing. Similar to Hannah before her, Irene was also a sex worker, and later investigation found that she'd last been seen outside a pub in nearby Chiswick on the 7th of April. So Irene really had been in the water a relatively short amount of time. It was only after Irene's discovery that Hannah's death was taken seriously by investigators as well, because there was no denying that these two had to be linked, the situation surrounding their deaths was incredibly similar it seemed there was yet another killer roaming the streets of London. Looking further into the similarities between them, the investigators also made links to two other unsolved murders they had on their books as well, that of Elizabeth Figg and Gwyneth Rees. 
Elizabeth had been found by police officers five years beforehand on the 17th of June 1959 near the bank of the Thames in Chiswick. She was specifically found in Duke's Meadow in Scrubland near the bank and this park, Duke's Meadow, had a bit of a reputation for being somewhere that sex workers were known to take their clients and it was concluded by a pathologist that Elizabeth had died only a few hours before she was found. Many items of her clothing were missing, her dress had been torn open at the waist and she had marks around her neck consistent with strangulation, so that was the cause of death. The perpetrator in this case was obviously never found, but it was very, very similar to these two new murders. Gwyneth Rees was found just a number of months before Hannah had been, on the 8th of November 1963. Once again, Gwyneth wasn't found in the river, but incredibly close to a towpath and only one mile from Duke's Meadow, at a household refuse disposal site in Mortlake. Gwyneth was also found naked except for a single stocking and her body was found to be decapitated, although that was thought to have been accidentally done by a worker at the refuse site, there was a lot of heavy machinery being used. Like Hannah, Gwyneth was also found with missing teeth, and the same as all the rest of the women, Elizabeth included, Gwyneth was a petite, young appearing woman. She was just 22 years old but looked even younger. Elizabeth and Gwyneth's cases aren't 100% confirmed to be connected to the rest of the cases I'm going to be talking about here, but plenty of people do consider them close enough in MO that they had to have been committed by the same person. Regardless, they don't really appear on any official victim list here. With news of all these murders reaching the newspapers, the sensational headlines dubbed the killer Jack the Stripper, making connections back to Jack the Ripper's murders almost 80 years earlier. Despite the media coverage, not many people in the public had any sympathy for the victims though. I repeat the sentiment from earlier, they were sex workers, people generally thought they bought it on themselves. This was a really rough area to work in, not only due to the dangerous nature of work, but because you were essentially outcast from society. When the sex workers of London started to hear of these murders, there was little they could do to protect themselves, it's not like they could go to the police with their concerns. Thankfully, police were investigating the murders now at least though, and pretty soon they came across a big break in Irene's case, or at least what they hoped was a big break. In Irene's flat, they found a business card for somebody called Kenny, who they soon tracked down as 57-year-old former soldier Kenneth Archibald. At first, Kenneth denied knowing Irene, but eventually he turned back up at the police station, saying a memory had come to him. He admitted that he did know Irene and he solicited her services from time to time, but not just that, he admitted to killing her. He said that he had argued with Irene outside the pub in Chiswick that night, on the night she died, saying he must have lost his temper and strangled her. He took off her clothes that he took home to burn and then rolled her body into the river. Now this was a confession as good as any, however soon investigators realised there were big holes in his story. Turns out he had rock-solid alibis for the murders of Hanneth, Elizabeth and Gwyneth and the police were very, very convinced that they were all the work of the same man. Then at his trial in June, Kenneth retracted his confession in full and pleaded not guilty, saying he'd been drunk and depressed when he made it. Seeing as there was literally no other evidence against him, he was let go and police were back with nothing. In this time, Jack the Stripper had struck again. The next victim was found in an alleyway in Brentford, not in the Thames, but it was suspected that increased police presence along the banks of the river would have caused the killer to avoid it like the plague. This victim was identified as Helen Barthelemy, a 22-year-old Scottish woman who had come to London in search of success. However, the rough city life eventually meant that she had to turn to sex work to survive, and it's likely through that that she met her end. Helen, like the others before her, was found naked with missing front teeth, causing investigators to make the link. But Helen's body also came with a very interesting clue. Investigators discovered tiny specks of what they discovered to be industrial paint on her skin, which led them to theorise that the killer was an industrial worker who would find himself around this kind of paint at work. Or maybe the bodies were even stored at his place of work, maybe a warehouse of sorts, before they would be taken to the river or an alleyway to be disposed of. More specifically, it was thought that the type of paint used was one that was used in car manufacturing, so investigators focused on such businesses across London. Four days after Helen's discovery, the police decided that they needed to go public with their investigation. 
More specifically, by this point, Scotland Yard had taken over, so Scotland Yard went public. They made a public appeal for any sex workers to come forward with any information they might have, being promised absolute secrecy and they wouldn't be at risk of being arrested if they did come forward. And this was big. It was stressed to sex workers that they were the ones most at risk if Jack the Stripper wasn't found, so it was in their best interest to share any information they might have. Scotland Yard said that they particularly wished to interview anyone who had been made to strip by a client and had been assaulted. And within just 48 hours, 45 female sex workers and 35 male came forward, and there's no denying this public appeal was very, very successful. But frustratingly, no information Scotland Yard gleaned from this ended up being particularly successful. So instead, they sent out female officers into the streets undercover in the hope they might come face to face with a perpetrator, and sex workers were urged to try and protect themselves in any way they could. This was kind of a huge 180 on the stance the media were taking in this case, which was very much victim blaming. And now Scotland Yard will come forward saying like, protect yourselves, do what you can, help us catch this guy and you won't be in trouble. Scottish born Mary Fleming was somebody who did this. She started carrying a knife with her at all times, but she was sadly found dead on the 14th of July, 1964. Mary's body was found outside a house on Berrymead Road in Chiswick after quite clearly putting up a big struggle. And once again, paint spots were found on her body. She also had missing front teeth. She had been strangled, although her body did show signs that she'd also been punched quite forcefully and she was naked. And this was a residential street. There were literally people living here and they recalled hearing a car quickly reversing down the street not long before her body was discovered. And this in itself was a clue that the police didn't have before. The killer drove a car. It was to be assumed if they were carting bodies all around town, but they didn't know this until this point. Something I failed to mention as well up to this point is that a lot of these women had sexually transmitted diseases as well, or at least suffered with them in the very recent past. Whilst none of the sources I found shared exactly what this STD in question was, or if they were all even the same one, could this potentially have been connected to the murders in some way? Or was this just maybe an occupational hazard of working in sex work in the 1960s? Investigators just didn't know, we still don't know. 8,000 people were interviewed in connection with the murders and 4,000 statements were taken, but they never even found so much as a suspect by this point. Jack the Stripper was a ghost. And the increased police and media attention didn't seem to scare him. After a few months of silence, Margaret McGowan was found at the end of November 1964. Margaret was her real name, but she actually worked under the alias of Frances Brown. Just like many of the other victims, she was found naked, strangled, and her front teeth were missing. She was also a petite woman, she had previous history of an STD, and her skin was covered in the very same paint flecks but she wasn't found in the Thames or nearby. She was found in High Street, Kensington, a fashionable, affluent area of West London. Whilst Margaret was a sex worker, she worked as more of a high-end escort for businessmen and politicians. She worked for the big money and she was last seen by a friend in the October as she climbed into a client's car, a Ford Zodiac or Ford Zephyr. Then Margaret slash Francis would disappear and her body wouldn't be discovered for over a month. The friend, Kim Taylor, was able to give a rough description of the client Margaret left with that night, and police were able to create an identical sketch of this man. If the man in question truly did look like this sketch, which is currently on screen for my YouTube viewers, this large round head, large sticking out ears, with relatively small features in comparison with the head, you would think he would have been found immediately, because this face is very distinctive. He was also said to be of medium height and a sturdy build. This sketch was released to the public, but nothing ever came of it. Psychologists believe that the killer was probably in public a very meek and shy man, and he specifically picked petite, smaller women as victims as he could more easily overpower them. But none of the speculation helped find him. Around this point, police started to suspect that this man wasn't even from London and potentially travelled in from outside the city to commit his crimes. The next and final canonical victim would be 28-year-old Bridie O'Hara, whose body was found in a storage shed behind the Heron Trading Estate in Acton. Bridie was found on the 16th of February 1965, but she'd been missing since the 11th of January. 
Once again, she had the same flecks of industrial paint as many of the other victims. At this point, the head of Scotland Yard's murder squad, a Detective Chief Superintendent John DeRose, was called off his holiday to finally take charge of this case. He was literally nicknamed Four Day Johnny because of how quick he usually solved cases, and if he couldn't do it, nobody could. Under his guidance, every vehicle travelling around West London at dark would have its details logged, and anyone found specifically curb-crawling for sex workers would be put on a special list for interview, and the men in question very much would be interviewed. It was all systems go in West London, every nook and cranny was searched, no stone was left unturned. John DeRose focused in even further on these paint flags, and 24 square miles were searched by a doubled police force for any paint in the area that matched this. Eventually, a matching paint sample was found beneath a covered transformer at the back of a building on the Heron Trading Estate, just yards from where Bridie's body had been found. It was also noted that Bridie's body was partially mummified when she was found, which did lead investigators to believe that she'd been stored near a source of heat. This very much could have been the Transformer. This was a huge break in the investigation, as it seems police had finally found the killer's hiding spot. It seemed to them that all the bodies were kept here until they were later placed out in the public to be found. But if you think that means they would find the man, you would be wrong. Over 7,000 people on the trading estate were questioned, cars in the area were noted down, and they even narrowed down the list of three suspects. They shared all of this information with the public as well, secretly hoping that the killer would panic, do something stupid, and give themselves away. Or maybe even better, turn themselves in. But they didn't. However, as I mentioned earlier, Bridie was the last body to be found. It seems that the killer was definitely scared enough to stop. The police were beginning to corner him. But this is obviously an unsolved case. They were still never able to find him. But it does seem that John DeRose had a big suspect who he was preparing to arrest in March 1965. This suspect was at the time known only by the name of Big John, as DeRose refused to ever share his identity publicly, apparently to protect his family who were innocent in all the crimes. DeRose would only share most of this information in his later 1971 memoir, Murder Was My Business, and he said that the reason they never made the arrest is because the suspect ended his own life before they could reach him. It seems the plan to share as much publicly as possible to scare the suspect had apparently had its desired effect, but it worked way too well. An author called Brian McConnell wrote further about this in a 1974 book called Found Naked and Dead, in which he said Big John was a respectable family man in his 40s who was originally from Scotland, apparently had a very heavily religious upbringing. He served in World War II and was essentially traumatised, turning to drink and sex workers, and he was even a police officer at one point before quickly quitting. At the time all the murders were happening, Big John was a security guard at the Heron Trading Estate, although other sources say he only worked there for three weeks. However, this was just DeRose's version of events. Many people don't believe his theory at all. There was a bit of drama when an author called David Seabrook wrote a book on this case called Jack of Jumps, and he concluded that DeRose was corrupt, framing a dead man as Jack the Stripper because the dead man couldn't argue back. Seabrook has said that Big John was actually a man called Mungo Ireland, and he left a suicide note for his wife that read, I can't stick it any longer, which DeRose claims referred to being on the run for murder, but I do think that's just a general train of thought for suicidal people anyway, that they just can't do it anymore. Mungo was actually supposed to be appearing in court on the day his body was found over a charge of failing to stop his car after being involved in a road traffic accident. Could the stress of this simply been enough for him to end his own life? Investigation into this over the years has thrown Mungo as a suspect into question, as it was found that he was actually in Scotland for Bridie O'Hara's murder. But Scotland Yard has indicated that they believe the documents proving this might have been falsified. Scotland Yard did reinvestigate Mungo's potential involvement in the case back in 2006-2007 and they concluded that the circumstantial evidence against Mungo Island is very strong and it was the view of the officers conducting the most recent review of this case that he was most likely to be responsible. So he very much does remain number one suspect here.
A former British light heavyweight boxing champion, Freddie Mills, has long been suspected of these murders. He was said to be a very aggressive, Cray-era gangster roaming the streets of London, and he was found dead in his car in Soho in July 1965, so just a number of months after the last victim was discovered. He had been shot in the head with a small gun resting in his lap, and the death was ruled a suicide, but friends and family refused to this day to think so, and they think that he was murdered, and considering the circles he moved in, that's not entirely unbelievable. At the time, rumours flew around Freddie's death, saying that he had committed suicide because he was actually gay and unable to live with it, and connections were made to a number of gay men throughout London. Or some say that his suicide was staged by another gang who wanted to take over his club. A reformed South London gangster called Jimmy Tippett was writing a book about organised crime in London, and he interviewed three generations worth of gangsters, criminals and boxers in his research process. Tippett says that even all those years later, he still found it difficult getting the people closest to Freddie to talk, but rumour has it that Freddie feared the police were closing in on him for a number of murders that he had committed, and he decided to take his own life rather than get caught. And it turns out this wasn't the first time this story popped up. Back in July 1972, a journalist called Peter Neal told police that he'd received information that Freddie Mills was responsible for the Jack the Stripper murders, that it was apparently common knowledge in the West End. Freddie was known to have a hell of a mean temper. Other sources even suggest that Freddie confessed to John DeRose himself, but for whatever reason, DeRose never took it any further. Perhaps he framed Big John in an attempt to cover for Freddie. I mean, members of the police force being compromised by gangsters sounds like something out of the movies, but it really was something that happened during this time, especially in London. If DeRose was as corrupt as some suggest, this really isn't impossible. However, investigating officers at the time stated that Freddie Mills had never been a suspect. Another suspect is somebody who remains unnamed to this day, but we're looking at another former Metropolitan Police officer who apparently had one hell of a grudge against the force after he'd been kicked out in the early 60s for committing a number of petty burglaries. This unnamed police officer said that he'd previously been accused of going corrupt, so if they were going to make accusations, he might as well actually be corrupt. After he left the force, he apparently wanted to make life as difficult as possible for former colleagues, and so he'd basically go around committing random crimes that they would spend many hours trying to solve, but they were never going to. The theory is that a suspect was Jack the Stripper, and he would commit all these murders with a very similar MO, with the last six bodies all found in different police subdivisions. Now maybe this was by chance, but the fact they were all in different jurisdictions is something that only a police officer would know. Turns out the suspect had worked in all but one of these jurisdictions. This was clearly a guy who was strongly motivated by a need for revenge, and he would have viewed the sex workers as disposable. As a police officer, he was probably instilled with a dislike of sex workers naturally, they were breaking the law after all. But the question is, why did he stop if this was him? The other suspects I've mentioned both died. Maybe it got too complicated to keep hiding, maybe he knew to quit whilst he was ahead and the police were focusing their efforts on somebody else as number one suspect. Maybe he was just smarter than them. Through my research though, it seems like the opinion of the general public doesn't sit with any of the suspects I've already mentioned. A lot of people seem to point the finger at a man called Harold Jones, a man from South Wales who had moved to London in the 1940s where he got himself a wife and a daughter. Harold Jones was also known by the names of Harry Jones or Harry Stevens, and it seems that there was good reason for that. Back in his hometown in Wales at just 15 years old, he'd been accused of the brutal murder of two young girls. Eight-year-old Frieda Burnell was lured to the back of Harold's family shop where he strangled her. He was acquitted at trial as the town folk were sure he'd been set up by a big city detective who had come in to help with the case. But just days after he arrived home, Harold lured 11-year-old Florence Little into his home and murdered her too. Her body was discovered in the family attic, there was no denying it was him. He was spared the death penalty because of his age and instead served 20 years in prison, and it was after his release that he headed to London because he couldn't exactly go back home. So this is a guy who had undeniably a bit of a mean streak, he definitely wasn't averse to murder. 
He also chose to kill young girls when he was a teenager, and this MO could have continued through to adulthood with small petite women. He had also strangled Frida and lived very close to the area that most of these murders occurred in, living within four blocks of both Hannah Telford and Bridie O'Hara. Around the time the murder stopped, Harold got diagnosed with bone cancer and he died in 1971. He was also employed as a metal worker on the Heron Trading Estate. Undeniably, there's a lot of information out there to make Harold look as good a suspect as any, if not even better. He was never considered a suspect at the time though, simply due to poor record keeping by the police. As recently as 2019, he has been re-examined as a suspect by a documentary called Dark Sun, The Hunt for a Serial Killer on BBC Two, and although nothing could be confirmed, they did agree that he was an incredibly good suspect for this case. Or, of course, it could have been literally anyone else. Any forensic evidence gathered at the time of the murders has been long destroyed or lost, there's no testing to be done nowadays to confirm or deny any suspects. Despite the intense media interest in this case at the time, and it being one of the biggest manhunts in Scotland Yard's history, it seems that for the last few decades, it has just for the most part slipped under the radar of the general public. Maybe a bit of renewed pressure could really be what this needs for somebody to come forward with answers or new tips. There's a good chance that the perpetrator might be dead themselves now, depending on how old they were at the time of the crimes but maybe that's what's needed for somebody on the outskirts of this case to come forward with information. Or possibly we're even awaiting a deathbed confession. It's truly heartbreaking to me how back in the 60s, sex workers found themselves in such dangerous situations every time they went to work. But what's even sadder is that it's still the case today. 60 years later, they're in just as much danger. It seems expecting people to just not be murderers is a little bit too much. I really hope one day we're able to get justice for the eight women who lost their lives, whether or not they can all be attributed to the same serial killer or not. As I said at the very beginning of this episode, as of 2021, the Met have refused to reopen the case, so it's currently not being investigated. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.